All right, good afternoon. Uh, we will start the one o'clock panel. Uh, the surveillance economy moderated by Connecticut Attorney General William Tong. General Tong, the floor is yours. Thank you, General Donovan. Welcome to Story Hour with William Tong. It will be my job to put you all to sleep over the next hour and 15 minutes. Uh, because of um, the COVID economy, I will be your only live guest today, but we have an August panel joining us for another discussion about the surveillance economy. Um, and, and we've really got some great thinkers on these issues. Let me first thank General Donovan again um, and his entire team here in Vermont for welcoming us. It is a beautiful fall weekend in New England, um, and we hope that, that our guests from other parts of the country get to enjoy our part of the country. I'm gonna try to get out and enjoy the lake for a run a little bit in a little bit, um, but it is a wonderful time to be here in Vermont. Let me uh, start by introducing our panelists. Do we have our panelists on screen yet? So uh, we're joined by uh, a number of folks. Let me first introduce our friend uh, from the South, Sarah Cable, who is the Chief of Data Privacy uh, of the Data Privacy and Security Division for the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. Um, she is an Assistant Attorney General in the office and leads the office's cybersecurity and consumer privacy protection efforts overseeing investigation and enforcement matters under the Massachusetts consumer protection and data protection laws. Uh, prior to her current role, Sarah was an assistant attorney general with the consumer protection division of the Mass AG's office where she investigated and prosecuted violations of the Massachusetts Consumer Protection Act. So can we give a round of applause and welcome Sarah, please. We also have Sean Davis, who is the Director of Digital Forensics at Edelson PC. Sean leads a technical team in investigating claims involving privacy violations and tech-related abuse. Sean is also an adjunct industry professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology, where he has taught and designed the curriculum for courses on cybersecurity at the undergraduate and graduate levels, and additionally serves as a committee member for the Federal Advisory Committee on Evidence Building at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Welcome, Sean. Claire Garvey is uh, a senior associate at the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law School. She was the lead author on three of the center's reports on face recognition. And her commentary has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and serves as an export, expert resource to both Democrats and Republicans in Congress and in state legislatures. Her current research focuses on the use of face recognition derived evidence in criminal cases and the ways activists, public defenders, and policymakers can ensure that technology is under control. So please welcome Claire Garvey. And uh, finally, but not least, we have Maureen Mahoney, who is a senior policy analyst at Consumer Reports. Her areas of focus include state data privacy, security, and data breach notification legislation, and the state right to repair legislation. At Consumer Reports, she authored the study, the Consumer or the California Consumer Privacy Act, Are Consumers Digital Rights Protected? And she co-authored the State of Authorized Agent Opt-Outs under the California Consumer Privacy Act. She also authored Consumer Reports Model State Privacy Act and Right to Repair Model State Law. So please join me in welcoming Maureen. Thank you. 
So we've had a, a long discussion today about the surveillance economy. And I think for many of us, we're still trying to figure out what that means. Um, and, and part of the exercise today is to get a better understanding and to get our arms around what it means to us personally and what it could mean um, to our constituents and our families and our community in our states. So I've given it a lot of thought in preparing for this panel. And, and to me, um, it just means that, that somebody's watching us all the time. And, and they're watching, they're observing who we are, what we do, what we buy, what we like, what we read, and they're making money off of it. Um, and, and as I think about that and all of the questions and concerns that arise from that, um, you know, there's, a, there's obviously an ocean of, of legal issues and policy considerations um, that pertain to that general understanding of the surveillance economy. But there is a, um, a much better and more eloquent framing of what the surveillance economy is um, in a book, Surveillance Capitalism, by Shoshana Zuboff. And um, in the New York Times Review, um, they summarized uh, Ms. Zuboff's thesis. And it says in the New York Times review of her book, according to Zuboff, surveillance capitalism distinguishes itself from its industrial forebear as a new economic order that claims human experience as a free source of raw material. We are the resource to be mined. The billion dollar profits of Facebook and Google are built on a general accounting of our lives and everyday behavior. And if you want um, to, to read her book, again, it's Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. And I just thought that that, for me, pretty well encapsulated um, this big issue that we're trying to tackle today. So before I move to our panelists, you know, it seems to me that there are some obvious questions that we're trying to answer, right? We have this quote unquote surveillance economy, gig economy, new economy, information age, and, and how do we regulate um, this economy in order to protect consumers and to protect our constituents in our states? And so that question is a federal and state question. It's an industry question. What role does industry have in self-governing and, and, and helping all of us as a society, not just governments, but as a community and society, build an infrastructure to keep each other safe while advancing innovation and technologies that enhance our lives? As part of that, another obvious question is, what do we do about our own personal information and protecting our own personal information? What rights do we have to our own personal information? And we, we think about all of that under the general idea or rubric of privacy. And I'm, I'm very fortunate that Attorney General George Jepson, um, um, my predecessor, I think created the first privacy department in any AG's office anywhere. Um, but that also tells you how new these issues are um, and how many of the issues we are confronting, if they're not matters of first impression, they're certainly of recent impression. And then, of course, um, over the last 24 hours, I've talked to a bunch of folks about how we look at privacy and, and, and our personal right to privacy um, and our personal information and how our friends in Europe, for example, look at it, or our friends in Asia. And, and the difference between maybe in the US, we see personal information as a commodity more often than not. And in Europe, they're conceiving it, of it as a personal property right. And then, of course, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is personal information to which we have a right to privacy, right? And, and, and is it just biometric information, who we are, where we live, um, 
height, weight, gender, um, sexual orientation, race, religion. Um, but I think we all know by now it's much more than that. And, and it's, it's, for me, it's most concerning and really comes into focus when I think about my kids. Uh, and I don't have to tell you there's been a lot of discussion over the past week about social media platforms um, and, and the role of social media platforms in our lives and in our kids' lives. And I have 15, 13, and 10, two girls and a boy. And so I am the proud, somewhat challenged father of two teenage girls right now. And um, every day I worry about their lives, not just with their friends in school and their peers in sports and school, but their lives online and, and the risks that they encounter. And obviously I'm, I'm very concerned because I see myself the messages that they're getting on social media. Um, and I like to think that we've tried really hard to raise two confident young women, um, but they get messages every day that show them um, you know, idealized images of young women and behaviors that, that, uh, that may make you more popular or more cool. And I can see how um, it can lead to young people, young women in particular, questioning their own self-image, their body image, their behavior, what they should do, what they should not do, to be popular with their peers. And I can see how that can lead to depression, mental health challenges, self-harm, and worse. And so this is a really very difficult stew uh, of, of new technology and an impact on all of us that we're all trying to get our arms around and, and figure out how to not just navigate, but to manage it and to protect not just my kids, but all of our kids and our families um, in this new environment. So with that um, opening, let me just uh, pose a question or a prompt to each of our uh, guests here today. I will start with Sarah, um, but here's my, my question. So Sarah, when you get up in the morning, and obviously this is your job, right? And you think about the surveillance economy writ large, you think about privacy, you think about some of the considerations that, that, that I talked about just now. What's the, the, the biggest question that you feel like you spend your time trying to answer? Or what question challenges, the, challenges you the most or eludes you or troubles you? You know, what is it that you chew on um, every single day when you're thinking about this area of the law and law enforcement? Sure, that's, a, that's an easy question, Attorney General Todd. <laughs> Kidding, Good. thank I'm you. Glad thank I you gave for you having a me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you. It's, I apologize for not being able to be there in person, but um, I'm, I see many of my colleagues from other states are uh, attending virtually or in person. So uh, it's nice to see some familiar names. You know, I think. Um, for me, uh, I cut my teeth on um, really coming at this from a lens of consumer privacy um, and, and protection of data. Um, and I got to say, it, that no longer feels like a very satisfactory approach uh, for me because I think, um, you know, privacy is important, but not just because privacy is important. I think uh, privacy is important because it's about control and it's about power. And someone who knows more about you has power. Um, that's part of why privacy is important. Um, it's it's to create a zone where you you know you are the the king or queen of your own domain. Um, and so, so I think for me the the nagging problem that um, that I chew on is how do we more fairly balance the economy between these tech companies and consumers? And you know you think about it especially with the disclosures of the last week involving harms to consumers and especially to teenagers, um, you know, you, 
you have the, the, the computing power of some of the smartest minds and the most power companies in the world who have some of the most granular detailed information about us on the one side, you know, and you have a consumer on the other. And that is, there is no way that can be a fair fight. And I think we can give consumers all of the power in the world to consent, to um, delete their data, to correct their data. Maybe we'll equalize the scales a bit, but I, I really don't feel it's anywhere near enough. Um, and I, I just think there's a, what the surveillance economy means to me is, you know, there's a fundamental uh, imbalance in the market um, between consumer and, and business. And uh, correcting that balance, I think, is is something that I feel um, a tremendous urgency around. Um, and I know my my AG, who I saw an earlier panel, furiously taking notes, um, uh, and I'm expecting a phone call from her, but I know she also feels that sense of urgency. So, you know, my job as a, 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 a lawyer who does consumer protection is to protect consumers. Consumers. And I'm looking at a marketplace where um, the stack is so heavily, uh, you know, been so heavily stacked against them. Um, you know, that's that's the problem that I want to take on. And, and and privacy is one way to do it. But I don't I don't think it's in, at this point it's the only way to do it uh, or that it's sufficient by itself. Thank you, Sarah. Let's come back to that that idea in, in a few minutes. But let me go to Sean and and pose the same question, and then I'll go to Claire and, and Maureen for the same question. You know, what what question do you wake up with every day, and I assume go to bed with every night that that continues to challenge you in this space? Yeah, thank you, General Tong. I think what scares me the most, and you know, from my background, I'm a technologist. So for the last eight years at Edelson, I'm taking apart mobile apps, looking at the source code. I'm seeing all of the data that's being sent in the background, looking at connected cars, IoT devices. So what bothers me is just the lack of transparency and understanding. Even consumers, you know, consumers will say, well, you know, this is so pervasive. We know these companies already have our data. You know, is this really a big deal? But they truly don't understand you know, the amount of data that's being collected and what their uses are. You know, I give a lot of presentations where I go into very detailed, you know, slide decks and I show videos and I show the actual network traffic being sent, you know, and what's being used and you know, how it's being used for. So, you know, I think it just bothers me in the fact that, you know, consumers just aren't aware and there needs to be more transparency and education, you know, you can't just throw in a privacy policy and say that you know we're collecting your data and that you know it might be used for marketing purposes you know i think it really needs to be instead of you're just being opted in to everything you know by default the consumer needs a choice and really needs to understand what's truly being collected and i guess just one quick example you know what bothers me the most is geolocation you know, companies collect a lot of geolocation, they say, because they want to know if someone looks at an ad online and they want to track the conversion, if a person actually goes into a physical store. But is that really worth, you know, the risk of the privacy ramifications? You know, if that company sells all the geolocation or if there's a data breach, you know, the New York Times ran a spread where they basically analyzed a database of millions and millions of geolocation points and they were able to figure out you know who they belong to through through re-identification you know where they went to school where they went to church so all of that seems very dangerous to me so you know i think it's very important to just be able to find a balance where companies can have innovation but we're not risking privacy and we're not just letting them do you know anything they want with the data claire Thank you, very happy to be here. Um, it should perhaps surprise nobody based on production that what keeps me up at night and I wake up thinking about is face recognition. Um, I've basically worked on this one topic for the last six years and will continue to do so. Um, but I do wanna frame it within this idea of what is consent, both in the online world and the offline world. I think something that really bothers me in a lot of discussions uh, around privacy is, and it's something that we, I think we all bridle against, this idea that uh, that privacy sort of doesn't 
really exist online or we've or the consent mechanism is choosing to be on social media that is the one moment of consent and a related point this idea that children that younger generations fundamentally don't care about privacy because they live their lives online the same way that older folks do or that luddites who choose to to avoid being in the online world do and companies certainly act as if this is the case. And I think regulations don't necessarily contradict that position taken by, by companies, which is really troublesome to me because I think it's fundamentally flawed. Face recognition comes into play because um, an example of this, I think is very clear in, in Clearview AI, this idea that the information, because it exists in the online world, that the individual depicted in a photo has fundamentally consented to the collection and conversion into a biometric of that photo. But what this threatens to do is fundamentally destroy a bastion of privacy that does exist in the online space. And that is the ability, as we do in the offline world, to segment our identity, to have different uh, uh, audiences or different aspects of our identity. I think about this, I really enjoy the, the British show, Sex Education. And I think about it a lot with one of the characters who is gay and from Nigeria. He has a persona for his Nigerian friends. He has a persona for his family. He has a persona for his boyfriend and for his, um, his friends at school. And they're fundamentally pretty different. What if he keeps those segmented in the online world? What if a technology comes along and is able to uh, connect those all back to him, back to his offline persona? That's what face recognition can do. And I think it's fundamentally incredibly troubling and stems from this presumption of either that privacy doesn't somehow exist or doesn't exist beyond that moment of consent from introducing yourself into the online world, or that particularly the younger generation doesn't really care about privacy. They very much do. Ask anyone 15 and younger whether or not they have multiple social media accounts. Maybe they won't tell their parent, but I guarantee you they are actually picking and choosing who they are to different audiences online, and that is their right. Um, so definitely something that keeps me awake at night. Um, and, and I have a hard time fundamentally thinking what the, what the solution is. Um, but I do think, um, to, to Sarah's point about privacy, is the, the angle at which I, I come to this, but I very much would love to hear the other mechanisms we have to help Maureen. Hi, so first of all, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today. And the question that keeps me up is how do we actually get privacy protections in place that are workable and meaningful for consumers? I think a lot of consumers probably assume that there is a comprehensive federal privacy law that um, protects the collection, use, and sharing of their data and requires companies to keep that secure, but that's just not the case. Uh, I do appreciate that some states are beginning to step into the, that gap and try to offer some baseline privacy and security protections for consumers, starting with the California Consumer Privacy Act, um, which went into effect just recently in 2020. Um, but that was compromised legislation, worked out hastily um, to avoid a stronger ballot measure. And like a lot of compromised legislation, it hasn't really made consumer and privacy advocates happy, and it hasn't really made industry happy either. They um, have had to put a lot of money into compliance. Um, so we've seen, you know, continual uh, struggles in California over the outlines of that law. We've also seen um, measures introduced in other states. And I think a lot of the bills that we're seeing now um, don't do enough to protect consumers. They're based on an opt out of sale model that would require consumers to opt out at hundreds, if not thousands of different companies. So I'd love to see a model that's more workable for consumers that puts limits on what 
companies can collect, use, and share in the first place. So the onus isn't always on the consumer to manage their privacy um, because there are real issues of scale here, especially if there are you know, all these new platforms and avenues through which uh, information is being collected, such as through facial recognition. And so at Consumer Reports, we're working to develop tools to make some of these existing laws uh, more workable for consumers, um, helping to develop the global privacy control, which Ashkan Saltani, who I'm stepping in for today, is the leader of that project to make um, opt-outs have a global option. But I think my big focus is um, how to make, how to get privacy laws on the books and how to make them um, useful for consumers. So getting back to Sarah's original point, if it's not a fair fight, um, you know, uh, and um, you have these powerful forces bearing down on individual consumers, then is it even fair to expect consumers to bear the burden of protecting themselves? And, and is, I guess I'll call it a sort of point of sale consent model, not just not workable, but, but um, not even realistic, frankly, to consider as a reasonable response. So that raises, you know, the bigger questions, which I'd be interested to hear um, your thoughts on. If it's not a consumer-based model or a immediate consent-based model, then is it something bigger? And and obviously, when we talk about fair fights and powerful forces and powerful corporate force forces versus consumers, we often look to not just consumer protection laws but antitrust laws. And, and that's when we get to a much larger conversation about leveling the playing field between powerful forces and consumers. So I guess I'll go back to you, Sarah, since you brought up the fair fight idea, and then I'll invite anyone else to jump in after that um, to, to work through that question. And another softball, thank you. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't, I'm not a, I, I used to do a little antitrust law, but I'm not an antitrust lawyer. So I, I can't see um, from a fully informed basis on, on is there an antitrust solution here? I mean, I certainly think there's work that can be done. I mean, I think there's a structural problem uh, with the market that, that needs to be addressed. Um, but, but looking at the problem, um, you know, from a, from the perspective of um, a more core consumer protection model, um, you know, one one thing structurally that I think could be um, should be looked at is is the financial incentives at play here, um, and and for that I mean, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of money flowing into this industry, and and getting back to Professor Zuboff's book, which I highly recommend, um, I'm I'm about halfway through it, but it is it is just absolutely enlightening and, and frightening to be to be candid. Uh, he makes that really hit home for me is that um, the, uh, the venture fund investments, the, the funding of some of these new business models, uh, no longer is it sufficient just to collect data and serve targeted ads. That That is no longer the competitive edge that investors are looking for. What she suggests is what they're looking for is the ability uh, not just to predict human behavior such that you can show an ad to them at the exact right moment and and therefore charge more for the ads, but to manipulate human behavior on a subconscious. Um, and, and, and it's that that to me is so frightening and so unfair um, where where forget consent, you know, this is this is a, a, a algorithm or or some other technology or tactic that's that's acting low in our brain stems um, to, to plant a course of action in our minds that we then do, uh, and then being able to sell ads on it, right? So that's, that's where, that's where the investors, that's where they're looking. Um, and that's, th those are the technologies that are, are, um, are being rewarded with investment. And so from my perspective, I think, I don't think that's okay. It is not heretofore declared to be illegal. But there ought to be some risks in, in pursuing that model. Uh, there ought to be some hard responsibilities that the companies involved in those technologies and who are profiting off it need to take on. Um, core responsibilities, what those are, I don't have a good answer. 
but this idea of you know internalizing all of the profits while you're manipulating human beings without their consent or knowledge um, and and foisting the harms back on people there there is no way I can make that you can talk about innovation all day long that is not acceptable I don't think and so highlighting that problem and injecting some risk and and um, and and responsibility into that business model, I think, is a, a place where folks ought to be looking at. I don't know how, but um, I think that's something that should be examined. Anyone else want to weigh in there? I'm just building off of what Sarah said. Um, going but going in a little different direction. I just want emphasize the importance of, you know, strong enforcement um, in resources to enforcement agencies, because when you have such a huge power imbalance between the companies and uh, the public servants that are in for which are tasked with enforcing that law, a lot of times it's not a fair fight. And, and you know, up against um, companies that have enormous revenues and enormous legal teams um, that have all the resources in the world to develop kind of creative interpretations of legislation. So, you know, we can spend a lot of time coming up with the perfect legislation and we do, and it's important to have that be right. Um, but, you know, as we're also seeing in Europe, unless um, there's enough devoted to enforcement, um, you know, it's just not a fair fight and you're not going to be able to get companies to comply. And just um, two quick uh, points. I think to your original question and, and this idea that it isn't a fair fight, I think an interesting analogy is over in the relationship between the state and the individual. We don't actually ask the individual to be responsible for protecting one's own privacy um, or other rights. It's the responsibility of the state not to infringe. So. It's an interesting model that we have between the state uh, citizen relationship and why is it so different between the um, between that and the, the company citizen relationship. Um, I think it's just an, an interesting point that I keep coming back to about this. What is the responsibility of the citizen? We would never ask with face recognition, for example, protesters ask, like, how do I protect myself against being surveilled by police or you know, being tracked, the answer is you shouldn't have to. And um, at least within within public or criminal law, that's that's not an, an expectation we have. Um, the other point, and this is at, at risk of being very, very bleak, building off of what uh, Sarah was saying, um, I keep coming back to this company, Alfie, who's partnering with ride-sharing companies. They're bringing face characterization into um, they're pairing it with the tablets in the back of ride-sharing vehicles to uh, serve targeted ads. Um, it seems that they classify people by their demographics, race, sex, age, whatnot, but also try to infer mental state and emotion by uh, reading individual spaces. And beyond the pale, I, most people who were, or read the articles about this find it deeply concerning, but beyond that, creep factor. I think the fundamental question is what happens when not just the online world, but the offline world and what we experience and receive from the offline world isn't the world itself, but a, a reflection of what a company or an algorithm thinks we are, who they think we are, um, how hyper segmented our reality and literally in the offline space, um, what we engage with on a day-to-day -day basis is actually defined by that um, as opposed to being presented with myriad choice that the offline world presents. We have a virtual attendee CLE code, by the way. I just want to note if you are getting CLE, please note the code. But I think this this question, Claire, that you raised again about the responsibility of the individual consumer, right? And consent, as we're talking about consent, it strikes me that I guess I consent to being marketed to, right? Um, watching television or looking at my iPad or 
even driving down the street and seeing billboards, I guess that's something that I don't have much choice about, but um, I don't really object uh, to those messages and, and, and having those messages pushed towards me. But I definitely, if I think further about it, don't consent to being manipulated, right? And um, I certainly don't consent to my children being manipulated. And so I guess the question is, is there something in that? Is there some line we can draw where the behavior isn't just you can buy, you know, a set of tires here at this price, at this place, you know, versus you should think this about yourself and needing these products, or um, in, in many cases, you should think this about our elections or, you know, uh, about um, election integrity and about our country and about your community and all of those messages, you should think this about vaccines or not, or masks or not. And so is there something in uh, the nature of what we're consenting to and that manipulation that we can focus on? I can. Oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of bring up one point to the current question and the last question. You know, one other area that has a lot of challenges in, you know, we think about first party companies, you know, and thinking about antitrust, you know, is Facebook too large or is Google too large? But an area that becomes more tricky are all the third party providers. So, you know, most mobile apps will use a variety of software development kits. They're called SDKs. So those could be collecting geolocation. They could be used for personality insights. You know, IBM, for example, their Watson supercomputer has a personality insights program, you know, within student education. Students will download a course module, but they might not realize that it actually has a third party library in it for adaptive learning. And even though the purpose of adaptive learning is supposed to be if I'm having a problem, you know, with a certain type of, you know, geometry problem, let's say, it'll help me by giving me more of that same problem. But what students don't realize and their parents don't realize is that it's actually collecting millions and millions of data points and it's putting them into profiles. So it could be that it's figured out that this student has this, you know, certain intellectual disability, or maybe they are just slower in general than other students. You know, and there have been a couple of videos that some of the providers of these platforms have made where they've actually shown, you know, here are some students and we put them in this poor category. And I just think about what if that company was actually sold? And then all of a sudden, you know, you're profiled as being a poor performing student. And maybe that will affect you getting into college or getting into a job. So I think it's, you know, we do have to look at the very large companies, but we also have to make sure to look at the third party providers as well. And then, you know, that's a big thing too, because a lot of these third party companies consent wise, they will pass the consent onto the app developer or the first party company. And then the first party company just doesn't tell the consumer or the student at all or the parents. And then they have no knowledge that that's actually happening. So, and that's a hard thing to figure out how to deal with, but I think that's an area we need to also look at going forward is just, you know, how to make these third parties and make sure that app developers actually even understand what these third party SDKs do so that they can get adequate consent and, you know, show exactly what's happening. I was just going to add on the point um, uh, regarding uh, you know, advertising and manipulation. I mean, advertising is manipulation, right? Like that is the whole point of it. That's, you know, certainly legal, um, accepted. Um, but there is a line where where exactly it is, I don't know, but there is a line between um, persuasiveness, um, uh, market persuasiveness, and, um, uh, you know, unfair, covert, um, uh, you know, taking advantage of weaknesses, pervasiveness, or persuasiveness. You know, and I think just old school, I, you know, I've got a, a, a book back on my bookcase with all of the old Massachusetts regulations governing door to door sales. Right. And then there's a regulation if, it, you know, people used to go door to door and do these high pressure tactics to get people to buy things. Uh, you know, our regulations regulate that it gives you a three day right of rescission if you decide you come to 
percent says you, you didn't want that product. So I, I think there's a, a, a long history of states regulating undue pressure by advertisers, taking advantage of of people in a particularly vulnerable circumstance, you know, boiler room tactics. I mean, that is that is the bread and butter of consumer protection lawyers. And I think, you know, the, the principles are exactly the same and it's not happening in person. Um, but but I do think some of this, um, some of the techniques that might be used by some of these companies are getting into a, a realm of you're not acting willfully. Um, you know, there's a there's been sure neuroscience could tell us a lot about that, but um, you know, it, this isn't just, oh, this is a new form of advertising. I mean, there is an, a, a manipulative element to um, the, the use of our data back against us that I think is, is, is leading to the same harms or raises the same concerns that a lot of our old school regulations um, also were trying to raise. This is just the newest tactic. You know, it's one, one frame you could put to this. In, yeah, and go ahead, Maureen. Just briefly, I mean, this isn't a perfect rule of thumb, but you know, one thing we try to do at Consumer Reports, and you know, the other panelists might disagree, but in terms of um, data regulation, we often think about what the consumer might reasonably expect. So, you know, a consumer might reasonably expect that a website that they're directly interacting with is collecting some information about them, but they wouldn't expect that um, everything they're doing across uh, the internet is being tracked and sold and used to target advertising. Um, so, you know, we think those those latter practices that consumers wouldn't reasonably expect, um, you know, there needs to be a lot to ring them in, you know, possibly even prohibit those behaviors, um, you know, depending on um, how harmful it can be. Uh, it, it seems to me also, Sean, you make a really good point, which is we're not, I think you call them first party or frontline um, uh, providers. You know, it's not just the big technology platforms. And, you know, it, it, at the most basic level, there's obviously a huge debate going on about Section 230. And, and I think that generally refers to large technology enabled platforms but there's a whole universe right of other actors out there and and other secondary tertiary technologies that all play a role in this and probably aren't well addressed by section 230 and so we're talking about data brokers right we're talking about app developers and it seems to me and I guess I would ask um, all the panelists for their thoughts it seems to me that we don't really have any infrastructure to address um, law enforcement challenges and holding all of those other different actors accountable, right, for for their role, not just in, in keeping um, data secure, right, but the impacts on their customers. Anyone want to jump in on that? Yeah, I could start by just giving one example. You know, I've, I've talked about data breaches and information being sold, but just thinking of a more practical use and where there is kind of a lack of protection. You know, the uh, National Association of Insurance Commissioners had had me kind of do a study and look into accelerated underwriting. So normally when you apply for life insurance, or at least in the past, you would do a medical underwriting where, you know, they would take blood and do labs. But now the companies are basically looking into doing accelerated underwriting where they can look at your data from you know, prior web history. They could look at you know, facial recognition. They could see if maybe you have a health issue based off of a template that's taken off of your face, tracking data from Fitbits. You know, all of this data can be pulled into there. Now, normally a consumer would be protected with FICRA in terms of you know, certain data can't be used to make a decision without the consumer being made aware. But a lot of this data that's being used for, or at least, you know, potentially being used for accelerated underwriting, this is a new area, is not, you know, under FICRA because it's not provided by a consumer reporting agency. So just thinking, you know, again, I think a lot of the insurance companies 
They don't necessarily want to use it to make a decision because it is a gray area, but they most certainly use it to determine if they want to retain people or if they want to market, you know, to them or not market to them. But yeah, I think that, you know, it's just kind of one practical example where there is kind of a gray area. And I think that, you know, anytime a technology company or, you know, a third party wants to, you know, they try to find these little gray areas and that is hard, you know, trying to have laws that will address every potential area that, you know, there could be a means to get through. I think another uh, example of that, there was a recent article by Carolyn Haskins about the relationship between Google, Amazon, and Microsoft and immigration and customs enforcement, which brings a whole host of issues, including the relationship between private companies that are aggregating data and these. Um, but in addition, what it was highlighting was these third-party contracts that where there's been a lot of public pressure on these public-facing companies that uh, consumers do feel like they have a certain degree of influence over because they have a personal relationship with an end product from Google, from Microsoft, from Amazon. Um, and there's also been a lot of... Um, employee uh, mobilizing and pushing back on Amazon's contracts with ICE, for example. Another avenue with which that sidestepped is these third-party contracts that no one necessarily knows about that allows these relationships to continue uh, completely removed and isolated from any sort of public pressure or um, uh, collective bargaining, that type of thing. Um, I think it's another just interesting example at a uh, plus one on, on looking at um, the avenues for legislation, but also looking at the, the harms as opposed to individual companies or an individual technology. I think that can often be limited in these massive loopholes um, with something as simple as a third party contract that, that we have to actually, what is the harm and what is the, what is the protection we're seeking to create as opposed to what company are we seeking to penalize or limit or restrict, or what technology are we seeking to, to constrain? And yeah, I would just like to add briefly that data brokers again, raise this issue of the limits of consent. Um, by their very nature, they live in the shadows, they're companies that consumers don't have a direct relationship with, and there are just so many of them. Um, so I really appreciate the work that has been done in Vermont and California in creating these data broker registries that data brokers are required to register to, and, um, and I think the AGs are in charge of um, managing these databases so that consumers on a basic level can know um, what these entities are. That being said, you know, there are hundreds of data brokers on these data broker registries, um, and it can be really difficult to, even in California, where you have the right to opt out of the sale of their information at these companies, it can be really hard to opt out. We've had consumers try to submit opt-out requests to companies on the data broker registry, and companies are asking for um, you know, a picture of their ID or a selfie that consumers are really uncomfortable with providing more information. So, um, you know, bringing these companies out of the shadows is an important first step, but um, we also need to do more to, um, yeah, control the, the harmful practices that these entities are engaging in. It, it seems though that, that even a data broker registration act or something is just it's just scratching the surface, right? Because um, what are we really consenting to? And as all of you are speaking, it strikes me that, well, maybe it's obvious, but, but um, it's not just the act of using our personal information to target us and sell us products, right? The personal information is used for a variety of reasons. You talked about the insurance context, there's law enforcement, there's employment, and so, the use of our data without our knowledge or consent or participation seems to me the, the possibilities are maybe endless in the ways that that data can be used on an individualized and an aggregate basis, right? Uh, in ways that might ultimately prejudice us in, in our everyday lives. I mean, 
isn't it much more than just selling products? Sean, do you have a thought about that? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, again, going back to not necessarily knowing, you know, if a company is even involved in all this. So, I mean, you have data brokers, companies or consumers have no idea that their data is going there. And if they do, they have no idea how many data points. I mean, you look at Axiom, Axiom releases a report every few years where they talk about briefly kind of how many data points they have. And I believe it was maybe four or five years ago, they had collected over 2,000 data points on every single American in the U.S. And then a few years later, that doubled to 4,000 data points. And again, as you had mentioned with a data broker list, you know, it's great to at least have an awareness that there are data brokers, but, you know, there still needs to be more information about what types of information is the data broker actually collecting? You know, if I was a consumer, I would want to know that Axiom had 4,000 data points on me and that some of those data points, you know, are about my religion or how much alcohol I may or may not drink or if I am, you know, eating fast food or not and, you know, different, my rate, all of this information. So I think if there was a greater transparency of the actual data types that are, you know, being collected and what it's being used for, you know, that would, would greatly help. And I did just want to bring one other example that I think people are really not aware of is now with uh, financial data aggregation. So General Tong had mentioned aggregation. So you look at platforms like Mint, where you can basically pull all of your credit cards into one single pane of glass. You know, at least as a consumer, I mean, you understand that you're using this Mint platform. You know, you might not understand what they're going to do with it. But then there are platforms that are called Yodely and Plaid, and there have been lawsuits against them recently. And basically what they do is a financial services company will import their software, and then the consumer, when they're connecting their, their bank or their credit card, they'll think that they're actually connecting to the bank. You know, it looks the same. It's got the Chase logo. It says username and password. They're actually sending that information to the aggregator. The aggregator holds onto that password. They wait until you log into your bank, and then they start screen scraping all of your information. And they're using that for the financial provider, but then it goes into the whole thing of they say, Yodley, for example, said, we can sell all of this data about your financial transactions, but we're going to de-identify it. But it's very hard to de-identify that. You know, if, if you sell timestamps and you have a unique identifier for someone, and then let's say I'm Target, and then I go and I buy, you know, all of that data, and then I find the one time that they purchased something from me at Target, match the timestamp, the purchase amount. Now I know every single thing that that person purchased, you know, and just... Again, just not having the knowledge of that. So I think as you know, more states get data broker registries, it would be great to have more awareness into the actual data points and what companies are involved. Sarah, did you want to add something? Uh, very quick. I, I agree with all of the points that are made, but you know, I just transparency is incredibly important, but it's important to get us to further protections. Right. And so it's important because, again, it is such an unfair fight. We don't even know the practices that are super problematic, the bad actors that are involved, what data is getting taken about us and, and, and how it's being used against us. I mean, at a very basic level, we at least need to know that. Um, I still sort of look forward to a future of we have some transparency. OK, now we know the full scope of the problem. Now we can talk about are there rules of the road we can put in place to give some predictability to these business practices to take the burden off of consumers from trying to police their data and chase it all over the internet? Um, so transparency is important, but I don't think it's an end unto itself. I think it's a, a necessary predicate to um, some more meaningful uh, uh, protections for consumers down the road. So and just one, one other ahead. point. Perhaps one place to start is to look at what, um, how much state data or state collected data lands up in data brokers, um, repositories um, like DMV data or um, I don't know public utilities maybe. Um, how much of this information is actually scraped and whether there is an relatively, um, I don't know whether it's low hanging fruit, but in my head it is 
to cut off the information it actually originates in state databases that lands up in these these larger repositories. So let me um, switch gears and and give a competing or contrary view, and and that is um, for every technology that we've discussed today. I'm looking at Sean again. You know, every cool new idea, every piece of software or middleware or, or some new application, um, there's uh, an entrepreneur and a company and a venture capitalist and a private equity fund and a company about to go public and growth and economic development for states. And, and do we need to think about that? And how do we balance regulation, which I think to many people in our country is often seen as a bad thing. That's, that's how the conversation starts. And putting more, quote unquote, red tape on industries that are growing so fast and change every seven seconds. I mean, what do we do about that, Sarah? I mean, you know, on Route 28 in, in your state, there's a ton of in innovation going on every single day. And are we gonna put the brakes on, on that? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, tr it's a tricky question. I mean, look, it, 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 no, um, you can't put the brakes on that. You shouldn't put the brakes on that. Um, but I don't think some minimal regulation is going to really put the brakes on it. And, and, and the reason I say that is I think just some rules of the road, just basic rules of the road that companies need to abide by that equals the, the playing field for large and small companies. Right. I mean, that's another important element of unfairness here is some of those entrepreneurs cannot break through. They don't have the, the troves of data or the, 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 the IP that they need to compete with some of the bigger players. So some basic rules of the road that all companies need to abide by where consumers understand what their the company, what, what is allowed to happen with their data. The companies have predictability of, of here's the line and I can't go below that line. I, I have to think, and I'm not an economist, I'm not an expert in this, but I have to think that would be helpful to some extent. Obviously there's problems, you know, you don't want too much red tape, there can be unintended consequences, but right now I think for, for better or worse, it's a wild west. And I'm a, you know, I personally believe that some rules that everyone understands and buys into uh, makes competition uh, more robust and healthier. And so I, I think there's a role for it. I think given the disclosures of the last few weeks, um, uh, there are harms that, that, that are staring us in the face that cannot be ignored. Um, and so, you know, this, I, 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 I think the harms of not regulating um, are, are becoming more concrete um, and, and some, some regulation will be needed. And, and I think there's a robust discussion to be had around what those regulations are and how much and but. Um, I, I think you can regulate and innovate. I, I really do. I think that we need to change the incentive structure somewhat. I mean, right now, since there's next to no regulation, companies are incentivized to collect as much data as they can and not really give a whole lot of thought about how they're going to store it and protect it um, in the hopes that there could be some use for it in the future. Um, even though the California Consumer Privacy Act puts next to no limits on what companies can collect in the first place, we did hear stories after the CCPA went into effect that you know, now that there's some regulation, companies have to, for the first time, be engaged in data mapping and actually figure out what they're holding on to and it incentivize them to get rid of a lot of old data um, that you know, um, could pose a security risk or liability or things like that. So I think if you put some regulation in place, it'll incentivize companies to move towards innovations that are more um, privacy protective, finding ways to make money that doesn't necessarily harm consumers. We've seen companies like DuckDuckGo rely on contextual advertising where advertisements are placed based on the content of the page rather than you know, targeting based on consumers' personal information. And then that could be just as um, lucrative as, as other forms. So I think um, you know, companies should take on the challenge of trying to be uh, profitable and innovative um, while also protecting consumers. Yeah, I guess my thought on that, I mean, if we look at 
So at the federal level, you know, eventually we probably will have a federal privacy bill. You know, unfortunately, a lot of the tech lobby is trying to put something in place where it will be, you know, the most minimum it can be, and then they ultimately want it to preempt state law. And that would be a terrible thing. You know, we don't want that. So I mean, how it is right now, you know, I understand that there are a lot of different states and it might be hard to keep track of, you know, all of the different laws in the different states. But the great thing about it is, you know, we're really finding out within each state, you know, what major issues are. You know, you look at my state, Illinois, you know, we have BIPA. You know, we don't say you can't do any sort of facial recognition. We just say that you have to actually tell people about it. And even though I think transparency is important, I ultimately think if it's something that's sensitive enough, it should ultimately be an opt-in. So, you know, it could be a thing of where basically, you know, companies can collect data, but if you're going to collect biometrics, you're going to collect genetic information, you know, we figure out what the most sensitive areas are and say you absolutely have to get express consent for that. And you have to actually explain what it's going to be used for and all of the purposes and all of that. You know, it would be hard to outright restrict collection of that, but I think just having an opt-in for that. You know, and there are various states that have, you know, genetic privacy law. I like the fact that we have all, you know, I just don't want it to be a case where I think if we had a federal privacy bill, we could set good minimum standards, but I still think the state should be able to figure out what's important to them. And then that also lets other states realize, you know, what the issues are. You know, after Illinois had BIPA, you know, Texas has a BIPA, for example, other states have been looking at facial recognition laws. So that's kind of my thought on that. Well, thank you all for your thoughts on all of these issues and questions. Uh, we have a few minutes left. So um, I thought I might open it up for some questions. I see General Camacho here. I don't know if, I, well, I might put you on the spot. Uh, are any of my other colleagues in the room at the moment or are they at the coffee stand? All right, General Camacho stepping up. I got a Sean worth it to come out to these things. Uh, Sean, I don't know if you correct me if I'm wrong, but were you on a panel with General Tong in January of 2020 in COPPA litigation? I think you, you warned us all about Google accounts for kids and Google education. So I guess my first question will just be, this last year we've moved a lot to remote and online learning and anything that you would imagine with this generation as we kind of inevitably are gonna have some kind of digital footprint, because you pointed out, you pulled out the source code and these trackers and kind of how you move from being underage and you become an adult and now they have, I have a six-year-old who's on Google for their, their school and I'm thinking, you know, they're gonna have a diff decent amount of data by virtue of the fact that a school has adopted Google as, as educational platform. And second question just for all of you is, um, I'm about halfway through surveillance capitalism. TJ actually recommended the book at that same conference that you were at, Sean, and, and uh, General Tong. And I'm about halfway through Durkheim. I haven't studied sociology, so I'm kind of falling asleep at, at points in my audible. Um, but I'm, I'm at the section where she talks about products themselves. And there's an expectation if I'm online, I'm sure you're going to get some of my activity. But you know, when your headphones are asking for access to your location, when your lights, your smart devices, your refrigerators, and if you disable them, they basically say, well, now you lose functionality of things that are pretty core to a, an application or a product that you've purchased. So, I, you know, wearing our consumer protection hats, I'm automatically thinking, and she points out in the book, you've degraded a product that you've said would do certain things in exchange. And, you, you know, it's inevitable, but like, okay, I'm going to, do I want to not be able to use this very important function? Or do I want to say, okay, go ahead and take a look at what my location when I'm using it? So just from the consumer perspective, not in the digital realm, but more of the, the smart products. Yeah, for sure. And I was on that panel and I appreciated that uh, General Tong is moderating today because I knew we would be in good hands from that last panel. And yeah, I've been working on the, the Google education case. You know, we represent a variety of municipalities and attorneys general and you know, what's challenging with the Google aspect was it kind of goes back to what we talked about, again, passing on consent. You know, Google is essentially trying to make the school get consent, you know, instead of Google trying to get consent themselves, you know, from the parents. And sometimes, you know, I was on a, a panel within, you know, the Illinois legislature and there were um, 
a parent group and they had said, you know, one day our students just came home with Chromebooks. Like they didn't remember signing anything or having any knowledge about that. And, you know, just what the danger is, is for one with the Google example, you know, students are logged into their Google education account. So once you log in, you know, you're logged in, like you have a session cookie that's going to last for a long time. But what people didn't realize is, is then when the students basically, if they go home on their home computer and they log into their Google account to check their email or they're still using their Chromebook, you know, that identifier follows them everywhere. So now you have students that are underage and basically all of their browser history is being tracked. You know, if YouTube is turned on, their YouTube history is being tracked. You know, and again, we talked about other other products that could be put in these, you know, educational platforms like Pearson or like Google. So, you know, it's hard enough for parents actually knowing what's happening with the main platform, but then you're putting in modules and then those have adaptive learning and all of these various things. So yeah, it definitely does present a challenge. I think what concerns me a lot about the increase in these uh, internet connected devices is certainly the privacy aspect where there's this data that is being collected that's often very sensitive that consumers aren't aware of and there are a few restrictions on what companies can do with it. But also the need for more data security protections to protect that data from hackers. Um, about half the states, I think, have data security requirements, but it's not clear that they would apply to these internet connected devices. California and Oregon do have um, laws on the books that specifically apply to these devices, but you know, I'd love to see more laws like that. And then to your point, I think another great element to put in those types of security laws is a requirement that companies keep um, Keep that software updated through the reasonable lifetime of the device so that you know once it expires it doesn't mean you can't use that product anymore um and also the option to use it as a dumb device if you don't want to have it be a smart device um so you know as consumer advocates those are issues we're really interested in that that's an excellent point and and Thank you, um, General Camacho, for bringing that up. And the Internet of Things, which um, I think is what we're talking about right now, is it also opens up its own whole set of issues. And I remember our uh, dryer failed last year. And I went online and researched and bought a dryer on sale. And it has Wi-Fi. And I'm like, why the hell do I need Wi-Fi on my dryer? Um, and, and I spent like two hours, because I'm the IT guy at home, trying to figure out whether I needed the Wi-Fi functionality and whether it was beneficial to us or not and how it worked. And, um, you know, it's not anything that I could consent to. It was, you know, basically the base model, and it came with Wi-Fi. And I had no say in the matter. Um, and so that opens up a whole bunch of other issues um, around privacy and innovation. Any other questions from the general audience or the audience online? Well, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for joining us for this discussion.